Want to know how to approximate with only signs and cosines, like signals or sound waves, for complex mechanical systems? Fourier, Ryan, Dominic, and Van. Fourier, R, B, and Math. Fourier, get out your paper and pen. Or face his wrath. Fourier series. Fourier series is a way to approximate a complex function using a series of only sines and cosines. This is useful in many ways because it can compress an incredibly difficult to work with function into trig functions which are very manageable. The function we are approximating must be periodic on the interval negative L to L, so it would make sense that our approximation is of the form. This is called the nth order Fourier approximation, where n is the number of terms of each trig function. Note that larger numbers of n will get you better approximations of f of x. We should note that b sub 0 times sine of 0 becomes 0, so we can neglect that term, and also that a sub 0 times cosine 0 just becomes a constant. So that long list of trig terms serves to approximate f of x on the interval negative l to l, assuming we find all the right a and b values. So, how do we calculate those? Ben, do you know? I do have the answer. It just so happens that every one of these trig terms in this big summation thing is orthogonal to all others. So this is orthogonal to all of these and all of these, and this is orthogonal to all of these and all of these, and so on. But what exactly do I mean by that? Well, each one of those trig functions can be considered an infinite dimensional vector. And these vectors reside in the vector space of all continuous functions on the domain negative L to L. You might have remembered that we called that C of negative L to L. And remember that this orthogonality just means that the inner product of that vector space, which is the integral of every pair of those functions multiplied, is zero. So if we take these integrals, if we do cosine of some random integer k1 times cosine of some random integer k2 with our pi x over l and pi x over l in there, um, we would find that that integral is zero. So that means that all of these are orthogonal to each other because they have just some, some differing integers in them. Uh, and that will always yield zero when you multiply them. And similarly with sine, we can do the same thing to show that all of these are orthogonal. And also with sine and cosine, we can show that these are orthogonal to each other. And remember, all of this is on the interval negative L to L because that is the period of this uh, periodic function f of x. So these integrals show that these are all orthogonal to each other. Uh, and we could show the uh, rigorous integration, but we don't have time but feel free to do it on your own time if you'd like. All right, so we've shown that these trig functions are all orthogonal to each other, um, all 2n plus 1 of them. But why does that matter? Well, this means that they'll form a 2n plus 1 dimensional basis for our vector space of functions. If we have a function f of x of infinite dimensions and an orthogonal basis of 2n plus 1 dimensions, and they're both in the same vector space of all continuous functions on the domain L, negative L to L, then we can project f of x onto that basis to get an approximation of it. So this is pretty much impossible to visualize unless you're some sort of superhuman or something. So I think it's best to think about it with a 3D analogy. If we have a vector in 3D space and a 2D subspace that's also in 3D space, in other words, a plane, we can project that vector onto that plane and approximate it with the plane's orthogonal basis. With that visual in mind, we can kind of bring up the dimensions such that the 2D plane becomes a 2n plus 1 dimensional thing, and the 3D space is infinite dimensional space, or as we call it, the vector space of all functions on negative L to L. It may seem reasonable that the projections should still work in other dimensions, even if they're infinite, and indeed they do. So now let's try projecting f of x onto one of these terms. So we're going to use a general form, cosine k pi x over L, where k is just some random integer, uh, it could be 1, 4, 29, whatever you want. We'll keep it general for now. And we can use the projection formula to get the amount of cosine k pi x over L that makes up f. Again, this is not possible to visualize. You just have to trust that when we take up the dimensions, these things still work. So we can run this formula, and we will get the inner product of f of x and cosine k pi x over L over the inner product of cosine k pi x over L with itself times cosine k pi x over L. Um, that is the projection formula that, we, that we've learned in class before. And remember, this is just the amount of cosine k pi x over L in the direction of f of x, right? So 
it's scaled by AK, if you'd like to think about it that way. So what we can do here is we can cancel out this term and we'll get this. So AK is uh, this inner product over this inner product. And when we do those integrals, we get that. And this is the formula you're gonna use to find A sub K for any of these, right? Except A sub zero, which we'll see soon. So we can also do this with sine uh, using basically the same process. Uh, we'll get a, our B sub Ks or this formula, which is almost identical to this one, except you have sine here. And again, as I said, the A sub zero term, it's different. So if you use cosine of zero, so if your K were zero, your, your projection here is like f of x with cosine of zero over cosine of zero dotted with cosine of zero. And that gives you one over two L instead of one over L. Um, just the way this math works out since all of these are one. So that you use these, uh, these three equations to find all of these coefficients. And those will give you your Fourier series for f of x. Okay, let's do an example problem. The first one will walk you through with it. So the first problem is find the Fourier series for the function f of x, where f of x is equal to l minus x, and it repeats once on the interval from negative l to l. So how do we approach this? Well, it's essentially plug and chug. We know that this up here is the original equation of f of x, and then based on what we proved before, we can just plug in the coefficients with the equations. So we know that a0 is equal to 1 over 2l times the integral of negative l to l of f of x dx, which once you plug in f of x as l minus x, you just get l. a n, do the same thing, 1 over l times the integral of negative l to l of f of x cosine n pi x over l dx, replace f of x with l minus x, do the integration, and you get the wonderful number of 0, where n is equal to 1, 2, 3, etc, etc. For b n, you might have to do a little more work, but the logic is pretty much the same. Plug into the equation, uh, replace f of x with l minus x, and this time, instead of cosine, it's sine. Do the integration, you get this somewhat ugly looking uh, equation, but it reduces somewhat nicely, so you get 2l times negative 1 to the nth power divided by n times pi, where n is 1, 2, 3, etc., etc., to infinity. So once you have these three coefficients, just plug them into the equation, the original equation up here, and you get l plus 0 plus the uh, integral from n equals 1 to infinity of 2l times negative 1 to the n divided by n pi times sine n pi x over l is your f of x with your Fourier expansion. If you take a function f and represent it as a vector, you can project it onto the trigonometric polynomial. Fourier, Ryan, Dominic, and Ben. Fourier, RB, and math. So get out your paper and pen. Or face just rough.